Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this video, we're going to look at LSTM and GRU neural networks for time series. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. We are looking at recurrent neural networks. Recurrent neural networks, there's a lot of different types of these. And we'll start by looking at one of the most classic types, mainly because it's relatively easy to understand. And then we'll look at the more modern ones, the LSTMs and the, uh, the GRUs. There are definitely some similarities between all of these different types of recurrent neural networks. So the recurrent neural networks, they usually have some concept of a context neuron. The context neuron represents a short of short-term memory. It holds a value between calls to the neural network. So when you're trying to predict with the neural network, that is one call to the neural network. Then you call it again and again and again as you predict row, 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 row. The context neurons start out as zero, but they hold a value as subsequent inputs come to the neural network as a sequence is, is being processed. So before we saw that we had these sequences that had values for each of the input neurons coming in. These context neurons have a zero at the beginning of each sequence and they have a, they gain a value and they keep updating their value as these sequences are processed. When you move to the next sequence, this value always goes back to zero. The contexts always go to zero between sequences. That's a very important characteristic of them. So this is an example of two hidden neurons down here that have a, that have context. So instead of simply feeding forward like we have before, we're now going to receive some reflux, some data back from what we're outputting. So you have the input, this is input one, input two, going into hidden one and hidden two. These neurons are going to output something based on the weighted sum of values that come into them and then the, the, the activation function. They're going to produce some output. And in classic neural network processing, that output would just go on to the next, to the next layer or out of the neural network if this was the final. But in this case, we're going to take the same value that was output from the hidden neuron onward, and that dotted line means we're going to copy it to the context. So typically you'll have one context neuron per neuron on the previous layer, and you're simply going to copy the output. There is no weight, there is nothing. It is simply a copy. The solid lines have weights. So what's going to happen is the uh, the input to to this first um, hidden hidden one is not just going to be what's coming from the previous layer, but it's going to get the output from context one. And it's also going to get the output from context two, at least in this particular case, the way that this neuron is, is, is set up, or this network is set up. These are both weighted, so it will learn how to process that value. There's no weighting here, simply whatever was output to the next layer is also copied to here. So you're constantly keeping the value from the previous um, output from the hidden neuron and allowing that to stay until the next call and then you copy it back. You let it form the input back to the um, hidden one on the, on the next call and it becomes just part of the input. So really, it's like there's three input neurons to hidden one, but two of those are the context layers that are just the outputs from the previous one. Now, this output really lives on. It's not like it just affects the next, the next one and so on. Since the value that was copied into this context gets fed back into here, it refluxes, it's almost like butterfly effect. It has an effect on what this is going, that this neuron is going to output, which then gets copied into here and here, and it keeps going for each subsequent call of this, of this neural network. That is how the context affects the output over time, and that is what allows the neural network to be time series. And the fact that these solid lines that are causing the copy backwards through the neural network, the fact that they're weighted allows the neural network to learn 
what to do with this data over time as it comes into the neural network. That is a time series neural network. So LSTM neural networks are a way of having that sort of memory. Now the really almost layperson way that I can describe this before we go into it really in too much detail would be if we had a scientific sort of calculator. We won't even use any of the fancy features of this calculator. We care mainly about memory plus, remember, and memory clear. LSTM neural networks and gated recurrent GRU neural networks have gates. And these gates are the real innovation of this type of neural network. They let it remember things for a long time or a short time. There are three gates that you're dealing with. The input gate, the forget gate, and the recall or sometimes the output gate. You can think of these gates as dealing with the memory of the neural network or the context. You can think of them as the memory buttons on a calculator. So say we have the output from the neuron is 5. We have these three gates and the three gates let you know what you should do. Should you remember it? That would be like memory plus. So I put it into there. We have that five now in the context. When it next works, we might need to decide if we should recall it. That's the MR button. That's the, that's the output or the recall gate. If you do that, your five comes back. And then there's also the forget gate. The forget gate means something happens with the neural network input. It decides it needs to drop the memory and you can now clear it. And if you do it, you can't even do an MR because there is no there is nothing remembered. It's important for these recurrent neural networks to be able to forget, and that was a limitation of the of the Elman neural network. It would just have to slowly forget over time. The other limitation was you couldn't hold something for a long time. So the fact that these new neural networks have the gates, you can remember something and put it into your memory and then forget it later over time. It's often been said, as far as human beings, one of our greatest strengths and weaknesses is to be able to forget. If we remembered everything, our minds would be simply too cluttered and we would not uh, be able to function. The important thing is knowing what to forget and forgetting only things that are unimportant. So let's look at the LSTM neural network. This is a diagram of the LSTM. You have your output, which is essentially y hat for the current time, previous time, next time. Now this is not three different LSTMs. This is the same LSTM and the LSTM is like a neuron in the in the network. You'll have multiple LSTMs, just like you have multiple hidden neurons. And you have input. This is the input over time. So you just have a single input value for the current, previous and next. And over time, each LS each the same LSTM over time is passing the y hat to the next one, so the prediction, but it's also keeping a context over time. All these, all these networks have some sort of context, be they Elman neural networks, classic Elman and Jordan neural networks, or be they more modern LSTM and GRU um, units. Internally, this is what's going on with a LSTM. You've got these gates, forget gate, input gate, output gate. And you've got a variety of clamping or of uh, thresholding functions, sigmoids and um, a tan H. We'll see those in a moment. You can look through this diagram if you prefer. Um, it, it basically represents the same thing as these equations. I almost like to think of the think of these in terms of the equations, and I'll take you through the equations pretty quickly. This is essentially looking at a. This is essentially looking at sort of a linear algebra uh, computation. So you've got the weights. That's the weight f. Weight f is the forget gate. Weight i is the input gate. The bias for each of these layers. So you have bias neurons. And then this vector of the output from the previous one and the input for the current. This is a vector that you're multiplying that weight over. So the first thing that you want to do with this, and by the way, s means a sigmoid function. Tan h means a hyperbolic tangent. Before we talk about sigmoid and tan h, let me show you that. Notice the shapes of these. This is a sigmoid function. It goes from 0 to 1, and it clamps these values. So if it's, if it's um, very negative, it clamps it to zero. It's a step function. If it's very positive, it clamps it to one. 
hyperbolic tangent, and by the way, this has nothing to do with trigonometry. Machine learning researchers just like the shape of these more so. It's a step function, just another type of step function. But notice that the, um, that the range is now negative 1 to 1, so it's, it's got a bigger, bigger range. And sometimes we need these negative values, and we'll see when we go through these equations that we, we do need those negative values. So let's go through the equations. The first thing we have to do is calculate the coefficients for the forget gate and the input gate and ultimately the output gate because these three values they're going to be largely zero or one because see these are where the sigmoids are used you want those to be zero or one because those values you want them on or off it's a coefficient so forget if the forget gate is calculated to be zero it's kind of backwards a little bit but zero means we should forget one means we should remember. So we calculate the forget gate based on the sigmoid function, which flips it sort of into that zero one range by looking at the weight for forgetting. So this weight for forgetting, that's the training capability. This value will change as the neural network learns. And by multiplying by the, the previous output and the current input, that, that vector, and adding the bias, which is also a learning parameter. So by adjusting these two, we learn when to forget. If f becomes a zero, we're going to forget. If i becomes one, we're going to remember. So you have the weights. These are exactly the same functions as before. These are your two learning parameters. Those will be adjusted. That's how it learns when to, uh, when to remember or when to feed the input in. C is your context. C with a little tilde above it just means your candidate context. Now, context is the value that it's remembering. The value that it's remembering is the output from the neuron. The output from the neuron can be negative 1 to 1. You can't use a sigmoid for that because negative 1 to 1, it's going to clip off half the values, anything below 0. So that's why we use a hyperbolic tangent. Because the hyperbolic tangent can flow between negative 1 and 1, so we've, we've got the, full, the fuller range of values that we can deal with. But again, the training works just like, just like before. We have a weight for the context, so that's how it's learning what to specifically do with the context. And we have a bias. This is just the candidate context. What really becomes the context is this. And now this is a different format because we're not, we're not learning. These are for learning. This is just a switch gate. Notice you have the forget and the input. Input says what should go into the context. Forget means should we remember the previous context. Plus just pipes both of those two together. So forgetting the context if this is zero multiplied, the, it's a coefficient. So if it's a zero, it's going to wipe out the previous context because zero times anything is zero. Input means, so this, this kills off the previous context if we're forgetting. Input, and this is why it's like the memory plus button because this is your previous context. I'm sorry, this one's your previous context. This is the candidate context. So this is what we calculated up here that might be going into the context. If we should put something into, so then the final, now that you've got the output gate created, your final output is essentially going to, is going to come from the previous context multiplied by your, your output. That is essentially how the LSTM is calculated. There's another type of neural, of recurrent neural network that is very similar to this that is called the GRU the gated recurrent unit. It works really extremely similar to this. Let me zoom this in a little bit. This is the academic paper. This is not the academic paper that introduced the GRU, but it's an empirical evaluation of gated recurrent neural networks. Empirical just means experimental. So they're not doing any sort of mathematical proof or hand waving. They're just literally trying it on test data and showing you what a GRU can actually accomplish. In a lot of cases, GRUs and LSTMs function really pretty similar and do sort of have a similar accuracy. None. This paper deals with evaluating more the processing time. Is a GRU 
does not have as many gates, and that makes it more simple. So you'll notice in the abstract, they're saying that they evaluated. Also, we found GRU to be comparable to LSTM. And they also evaluated on previous non-recurrent neural networks. So if we look through the paper, the part that I want to show you that is particularly interesting is you have here the LSTM that we just looked at with its gates. You can see the input gate up at the top, the F gate there, and the output gate there. So you have three gates. In the recurrent, or the uh, GRU, uh, you just have the, um, you just have two gates, R and Z. So it's a, it's a simpler sort of algorithm to that, and it does not require nearly, since there's another gate, it requires much less computation time. And they show you how to calculate these gates. But at the very, very end, the paper gets to showing the learning and showing really that the LSTM and GRU are somewhat equivalent, and they show wall clock time. Notice here the GRU is taking much less time to process than the GR, uh, than the LSTM. So that's that's their advantage. You can process much more. Your your training epochs will take epochs will take much less much less time. Now we're going to look at an actual example of LSTM. We're going to see two examples. The first example is just really really simple. It's meant to show you what this recurrent type of neural network can do just in its most simple state and yet do something that a normal neural network would not be able to do. And then the next example will look like we'll look at an actual application where we look at time series data for sin spots. And we'll see how this type of recurrent neural network can predict something that is time series and be able to, at least in a very basic way, predict predict sunspot activity. So this is showing you how to build a very simple TensorFlow through Keras LSTM neural network. I'm going to go ahead and run this. It takes it a moment to train, but it's not too bad. So it's running there. You can see that from the asterisk. This is showing the neural network how to predict something from time series. This time series is essentially almost, think of it like a camera in front of a house, like a, just a pinhole camera. It sees a car driving by, and it might see just a little bit of the paint color as the car is going by. So the same position, we're looking straight through, we're seeing zero, that means we're seeing nothing. But then at the next time slice, we see a car. Then at the next time slice again, we still see the car because it's, it's going in front of our pinhole that we're seeing. And now we see zero again for the rest of the sequence because basically the car has cleared our pinhole and has moved on its way. So these are sequences. Here a different colored car goes by, a, a two colored car, whatever two happens to be. Maybe that's, maybe one's red, two's blue, something such as that. Ideally, if we wanted to make this more advanced, we would probably have three inputs and we would make this some sort of RGB for each and every single one of these. But we're dealing with a very, very simple example. I have these training set elements and I'm setting the Y up so that the Y, in this case, it's saying, hey, a one colored car went by. The second one is a two colored car, then a three colored car. Then we have an example of a two colored car again, and that's two, and another example of three and one. It's teaching the neural network that no matter where at in that sequence it is at, you, it's still that color car. It just, this one car, it, it barely made it into our time slice because it, it showed up later than these other ones but it's still a one colored car. It's the same as this car up here that occurred very early. So what we do next is we, we take all of these elements and we're going to train it. Now, by the way, we could represent, since there's just one input, we could represent this as an old school neural network. We would have one, two, three, four, five, six. We would have six inputs, but the problem is the one, and we would have to get rid of all these, we would, 
if we wanted to do that, we would basically get rid of all these, whoops, not get rid of the number, but we would get rid of all these square, square brackets and we would make them all look like that. And it would just be classic inputs. We don't want to do that. We're treating these as sequences. But even if they were classic inputs, these were all in these were all this would be input one, input two, input three. If you move something that was on input one to input three, that's a whole different pattern recognition to the neural network. You can't just flexibly move these ones to way over here and have it still recognize it in classic neural networks. In LSTMs, you absolutely can't. So this neural network is trained. And we have the output here. And you see the results from training. We trained it for 200 epochs. That ran for a little while. Not too bad. It was running in the background while I was explaining things. And there we, we have it. So now, for this neural network, I have this code down here, and I can try examples on it. Now, let me... This code is meant that I can just modify it in any way that I want to. So this is a live demo. I don't know exactly what it's going to produce. I hope it's going to produce something that makes it look smart. That's the idea. So this is two. So this is a two-colored car that happened to be going through here. I can run it, and I hope it will say two, which it does. If that two-colored car occurred here, got rid of an extra brace that I didn't want to, it should still say two. Or not if I forgot a comma. Okay, my computer was not in insert mode anymore. So let's go ahead and run that. Okay, there it does It does happen to uh, confuse it if you get near the beginning. So that's two. As this two, so if we moved it more over there, it should still see it as a two. If we make it longer, that could mean it's a longer car, or it could mean that it was a slower moving car. Uh, it still should say two. If we switch this all over to ones, it should recognize that this is a one colored car, which it does. If, I don't know, this is a one colored car with a little bit of red, uh, two color paint in it, maybe maybe one is blue, two is red. See what it does there, I have no idea what it'll do there. Oh, it recognizes it as a, as a two car, but at least it doesn't recognize it as say a three or something such as that. So this is learning sequence. You can see in just a very, very simple, simple example that it learns to recognize these, these patterns. And it can even be very short, and it recognizes it. So that's the power of an LSTM. It recognizes these, these patterns really sort of over time. Next, we're going to look at Sunspot's example. Now, you can get daily Sunspot data files from this website. I have them loaded onto my instance, but you would have to download these if you want to run this particular example. So let's go ahead and read this in. This shows you basically the year, and it goes back pretty far. So 1818 first month, first day, it gives you, um, and by the way, this value is just a way of encoding the date and the year. It gives you the sunspot value, negative one means that we don't have it, and the, um, the observation number, the number of observations. So there's quite a bit of missing data near the beginning of the file. If we run it and we trim the rows that have missing observations, we have 11,000 and something. And we can also just take the, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the training set of everything before the year 2000. We're going to take the test set that we're going to evaluate it on as everything after 2000. And we create a training set for each of these. So we create a set of um, pandas for the training, one for the test, for the sunspot value, that's what we're trying to predict, the actual sunspot count, and we print out the number of observations of each that we have. So the training data are definitely bigger. You have nearly 55, you have over 55,000. The test set has a little over 6,000 values. Now what we've got to do is convert this into sequences. And this is the, this is perhaps the somewhat tricky part of this. So this takes that sunspot data like we had and converts it into a cube like we're going to use to train the LSTM with. To do this, what we do is we have to use this two sequences function. So this gives you the sequence size and then the observations. So the sequence size is going to be what we define the sequence size to be, so it's going to be 10. You take the data and you chop out 10 observations, then you move forward a little bit, chop out the next 10, the next 10. It's a sliding window across. 
and it builds all those rows of the of the cube but with the observations on back so here we have the we have it converted into that sequence so we take the window by getting the observations from 1 up to 1 plus the up to i plus the sequence size we're looping over the entire range of observations, so whatever the length of observations is, up to minus the sequence size, so that we stop while we still have enough to build out an entire sequence. And we essentially build, build this up. If we looked at what this really looked like, X train, I print out the shape of them up here. The shape of them, so it's got 55,000 rows, it's got the 10, which is the sequence, but it's only got the one column because it's just the value that we're trying to predict over time, the number of sunspots. We just print out X train. This is kind of what it looks like. You're seeing the individual sunspot values going across. It's a three dimensional um, data structure. So you have the 255, 255 up to here. That's one row. And you have all of the sunspot values, the 10 of them across. There's not enough to display 10, so that's why you've got the, uh, the the three dots. Now we are going to try to build the model and fit it. When we run this, it's going to train it for a thousand epochs. And that takes a little bit of time. We do have an early stopping going on, so it's not going to take that, it's not really going to take that full amount of time. This is potentially something that a GPU instance would um, would train a lot faster, but we we will see that example. We'll see an example of that on the last class when we use when we do high performance computing and we make use of a GPU instance among among other things. So we've got six thousand one hundred thirty one samples that we're training on. We result we report the validation loss. Notice it's quickly dropping. After we let it go a while, it won't hit the entire one thousand. It will it will stop. But I'll let this run on time lapse here real quick. All right, early stopping has kicked in. You can see that that kicked in after 16 epochs, and we now have the neural network trained and ready to go. And we can see what the RMSC. So it's predicting a plus or minus 22 sunspots, and you can that gives you an idea of the overall accuracy. It's not a particularly advanced network, but it does show how you represent the data going in. Breaking up into those sequences with the uh, with the two sequences function that I gave you is definitely the key part of of doing that. Thank you for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to look at how we can use LSTMs and CNNs together to caption images. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.